a connecticut yankee in king arthur's court by mark twain chapter twenty one the pilgrims when i did get to bed at last i was unspeakably tired the stretching out and the relaxing of the long tense muscles how luxurious how delicious but that was as far as i could get sleep was out of the question for the present the ripping and tearing and squealing of the nobility up and down the halls and corridors was pandemonium come again and kept me broad awake being awake my thoughts were busy of course and mainly they busied themselves with sandy's curious delusion here she was as sane a person as the kingdom could produce and yet from my point of view she was acting like a crazy woman my land the power of training of influence of education it can bring a body up to believe anything i had to put myself in sandy's place to realize that she was not a lunatic yes and put her in mine to demonstrate how easy it is to seem a lunatic to a person who has not been taught as you have been taught if i had told sandy i had seen a wagon uninfluenced by enchantment spin along fifty miles an hour had seen a man unequipped with magic powers get into a basket and soar out of sight among the clouds and had listened without any necromancer's help to the conversation of a person who was several hundred miles away sandy would not merely have supposed me to be crazy she would have thought she knew it everybody around her believed in enchantments nobody had any doubts to doubt that a castle could be turned into a sty and its occupants into hogs would have been the same as my doubting among connecticut people the actuality of the telephone and its wonders and in both cases would be absolute proof of a diseased mind an unsettled reason yes sandy was sane that must be admitted if i also would be sane to sandy i must keep my superstitions about unenchanted and unmiraculous locomotives balloons and telephones to myself also i believed that the world was not flat and hadn't pillars under it to support it nor a canopy over it to turn off a universe of water that occupied all space above but as i was the only person in the kingdom afflicted with such impious and criminal opinions i recognized that it would be good wisdom to keep quiet about this matter too if i did not wish to be suddenly shunned and forsaken by everybody as a madman the next morning sandy assembled the swine in the dining-room and gave them their breakfast waiting upon them personally and manifesting in every way the deep reverence which the natives of her island ancient and modern have always felt for rank let its outward casket and the mental and moral contents be what they may i could have eaten with the hogs if i had had birth approaching my lofty official rank but i hadn't and so accepted the unavoidable slight and made no complaint sandy and i had our breakfast at the second table the family were not at home i said how many are in the family sandy and where do they keep themselves family yes which family good my lord why this family your own family sooth to say i understand you not i i have no family no family why sandy isn't this your home now how indeed might that be i have no home well then uh, whose home is this ah uh, which you well i would tell you and i knew myself come you don't even know these people then who invited us here not invited us we but came that is all why woman this is a most extraordinary performance the effrontery of it is beyond admiration we blandly march into a man's house and cram it full of the only really valuable nobility the sun has yet discovered in the earth and then it turns out that we don't even know the man's name how did you ever venture to take this extravagant liberty i supposed of course it was your home what will the man say what will he say forsooth what can he say but give thanks thanks for what her face was filled with a puzzled surprise verily thou troublest mine understanding with strange words do you dream that one of his estate is like to have the honor twice in his life to entertain company such as we have brought to grace his house withal well no when you come to that no it's it's an even bet that this is the first time he has had a treat like this then let him be thankful 
and manifest the same by grateful speech and due humility. He were a dog else in the air and ancestor of dogs. To my mind the situation was uncomfortable. It might become more so. It might be a good idea to muster the hogs and move on. So I said, The day is wasting, Sandy. It is time to get the nobility together and be moving. Wherefore, fair sir and boss? We want to take them to their home, don't we? La, but list to him. They be of all the regions of the earth. Each must hie to her own home. Wend you, we might do all these journeys in one so brief life as he hath appointed that created life, and thereto death likewise with help of Adam, who by sin done through persuasion of his helpmeet, she being wrought upon the betrayed by the beguilements of the great enemy of man, that serpent hight Satan, aforetime consecrated and set apart unto that evil work by overmastering spite and envy begotten in his heart through fell ambitions that did blight and mildew a nature erst so white and pure, when so it hove with the shining multitudes its brethren born in glade and shade of that fair heaven, wherein all such as native be to that rich estate and great Scott. My lord? Well, you know we haven't got time for this sort of thing. Don't you see, we could distribute these people around the earth in less time than it is going to take you to explain that we can't. We mustn't talk now. We must act. You want to be careful. You mustn't let your mill get the start of you that way, at a time like this. To business now, and sharp's the word. Who is to take the aristocracy home? Even their friends. These will come for them from the far parts of the earth. This was lightning from a clear sky, for unexpectedness, and the relief of it was like pardon to a prisoner. She would remain to deliver the goods, of course. Well, then, Sandy, as our enterprise is handsomely and successfully ended, I will go home and report, and if ever another one— I also am ready. I will go with thee. This was recalling the pardon. How? How will you go with me? Why should you? Will I be traitor to my knight, dost think? That were dishonor. I may not part from thee until in knightly encounter in the field some overmatching champion shall fairly win and fairly wear me. I were to blame, and I thought that that might ever hap. Elected for the long term, I sighed to myself. I may as well make the best of it. So then I spoke up and said, All right, let us make a start. While she was gone to cry her farewells over the pork, I gave that whole peerage away to the servants, and I asked them to take a duster and dust around a little where the nobilities had mainly lodged and promenaded, but they considered that that would be hardly worth while, and would moreover be a rather grave departure from custom, and therefore likely to make talk. A departure from custom, that settled it. It was a nation capable of committing any crime but that. The servants said they would follow the fashion a fashion grown sacred through immemorial observance. They would scatter fresh rushes in all the rooms and halls, and then the evidence of the aristocratic visitation would be no longer visible. It was a kind of satire on nature. It was the scientific method, the geologic method. It deposited the history of the family in a stratified record, and the antiquary could dig through it and tell by the remains of each period what changes of diet the family had introduced successively for a hundred years. The first thing we struck that day was a procession of pilgrims. It was not going our way, but we joined it, nevertheless, for it was hourly being borne in upon me now that if I would govern this country wisely, I must be posted in the details of its life, and not at second hand, but by personal observation and scrutiny. This company of pilgrims resembled Chaucer's in this, that it had in it a sample of about all the upper occupations and professions the country could show, and a corresponding variety of costume. There were young men and old men, young women and old women, lively folk and grave folk. They rode upon mules and horses, and there was not a side-saddle in the party, for this specialty was to remain unknown in England for nine hundred years yet. It was a pleasant friendly, sociable herd, pious, happy, merry, and full of unconscious coarseness and innocent indecencies. What they regarded as the merry tale went the continual round and caused no more embarrassment than it would have caused in the best English society twelve centuries later. 
practical jokes worthy of the english wits of the first quarter of the far-off nineteenth century were sprung here and there and yonder along the line and compelled the delightedest applause and sometimes when a bright remark was made at one end of the procession and started on its travels toward the other you could note its progress all the way by the sparkling spray of laughter it threw off from its bows as it ploughed along and also by the blushes of the mules in its wake sandy knew the goal and purpose of this pilgrimage and she posted me she said they journey to the valley of holiness for to be blessed of the godly hermits and drink of the miraculous waters and be cleansed from sin where is this watering place it lieth a two-day journey hence by the borders of the land that height the cuckoo kingdom tell me about it is it a celebrated place oh of truth yes there be none more so of old time there lived there an abbot and his monks belike were none in the world more holy than these for they gave themselves to study of pious books and spoke not the one to the other or indeed to any and ate decayed herbs and naught thereto and slept hard and prayed much and washed never also they wore the same garment until it fell from their bodies through age and decay right so came they to be known of all the world by reason of these holy austerities and visited by rich and poor and reverenced proceed but always there was lack of water there whereas upon a time the holy abbot prayed and for answer a great stream of clear water burst forth by miracle in a desert place now were the fickle monks tempted of the fiend and they wrought with their abbot unceasingly by beggings and beseechings that he would construct a bath and when he was become a weary and might not resist more he said have ye your will then and granted that they asked now mark thou what tis to forsake the ways of purity the which he loveth and wanton with such as be worldly and an offence these monks did enter into the bath and come thence washed as white as snow and lo in that moment his sign appeared in miraculous rebuke for his insulted waters ceased to flow and utterly vanished away they fared mildly sandy considering how that kind of crime is regarded in this country belike but it was their first sin and they had been of perfect life for long and differing in naught from the angels prayers tears torturings of the flesh all was vain to beguile that water to flow again even processions even burnt offerings even votive candles to the virgin did fail every each of them and all in the land did marvel how odd to find that even this industry has its financial panics and at times sees its assignats and greenbacks languish to zero and everything come to a standstill go on sandy and so upon a time after year and day the good abbot made humble surrender and destroyed the bath and behold his anger was in that moment appeased and the waters gushed richly forth again and even unto this day they have not ceased to flow in that generous measure then i take it nobody has washed since he that would assay it could have his halter free yes and swiftly would he need it too the community has prospered since even from that very day the fame of the miracle went abroad into all lands from every land came monks to join they came even as the fishes come in shoals and the monastery added building to building and yet others to these and so spread wide its arms and took them in and nuns came also and more again and yet more and built over against the monastery on the yon side of the vale and added building to building until mighty was that nunnery and these were friendly unto those and they joined their loving labors together and together they built a fair and great foundling asylum midway of the valley between you spoke of some hermits sandy these have gathered there from the ends of the earth a hermit striveth best where there be multitudes of pilgrims ye shall not find no hermit of no sort wanting if any shall mention a hermit of a kind he thinketh new and not to be found but in some far strange land let him but scratch among the holes and caves and swamps that line that valley of holiness and whatsoe'er be his breed it skills not he shall find a sample of it there i closed up alongside of a burly fellow with a fat good-humoured face proposing to make myself agreeable and pick up some further crumbs of fact 
but I had hardly more than scraped acquaintance with him when he began eagerly and awkwardly to lead up, in the immemorial way, to that same old anecdote, the one Sir Dinadan told me, what time I got into trouble with Sir Sagamore, and was challenged of him on account of it. I excused myself, and dropped to the rear of the procession, sad at heart, willing to go hence from this troubled life, this veil of tears, this brief day of broken rest, of cloud and storm, of weary struggle and monotonous defeat, and yet shrinking from the change, as remembering how long eternity is, and how many have wended thither who know that anecdote. Early in the afternoon we overtook another procession of pilgrims, but in this one was no merriment, no jokes, no laughter, no playful ways, nor any happy giddiness, whether of youth or age. Yet both were here, both age and youth, gray old men and women, strong men and women of middle age, young husbands, young wives, little boys and girls, and three babies at the breast. Even the children were smileless. There was not a face among all these half a hundred people but was cast down, and bore that set expression of hopelessness which is bred of long and hard trials and old acquaintance with despair. They were slaves. Chains led from their fettered feet and their manacled hands to a sole-leather belt about their waists, and all except the children were also linked together in a file six feet apart by a single chain which led from collar to collar all down the line. They were on foot, and had tramped three hundred miles in eighteen days, upon the cheapest odds and ends of food, and stingy rations of that. They had slept in these chains every night, bundled together like swine. They had upon their bodies some poor rags, but they could not be said to be closed. Their irons had chafed the skin from their ankles, and made sores which were ulcerated and wormy. Their naked feet were torn, and none walked without a limp. Originally there had been a hundred of these unfortunates, but about a half had been sold on the trip. The trader in charge of them rode a horse and carried a whip with a short handle and a long heavy lash divided into several knotted tails at the end. With this whip he cut the shoulders of any that tottered from weariness and pain, and straightened them up. He did not speak. The whip conveyed his desire without that. None of these poor creatures looked up as we rode along by. They showed no consciousness of our presence, and they made no sound but one. That was the dull and awful clank of their chains from end to end of the long file, as forty-three burdened feet rose and fell in unison. The file moved in a cloud of its own making. All these faces were gray with a coating of dust. One has seen the like of this coating upon furniture in unoccupied houses, and has written his idle thought in it with his finger. I was reminded of this when I noticed the faces of some of those women, young mothers carrying babes that were near to death and freedom, how a something in their hearts was written in the dust upon their faces, plain to see, and, Lord, how plain to read, for it was the track of tears. One of these young mothers was but a girl, and it hurt me to the heart to read that writing, and reflect that it was come up out of the breast of such a child, a breast that ought not to know trouble yet but only the gladness of the morning of life. And no doubt she reeled just then, giddy with fatigue, and down came the lash and flicked a flake of skin from her naked shoulder. It stung me as if I had been hit instead. The master halted the file and jumped from his horse. He stormed and swore at this girl, and said she had made annoyance enough with her laziness, and as this was the last chance he should have, he would settle the account now. She dropped on her knees and put up her hands, and began to beg and cry and implore in a passion of terror, but the master gave no attention. He snatched the child from her, and then made the men-slaves who were chained before and behind her throw her on the ground and hold her there and expose her body. And then he laid on with his lash like a madman till her back was flayed, she shrieking and struggling the while piteously. One of the men who was holding her turned away his face and for this humanity he was reviled and flogged. All our pilgrims looked on and commented on the expert way in which the whip was handled. They were too much hardened by lifelong everyday familiarity with slavery to notice that there was anything else in the exhibition that invited comment. This was what slavery could do, in the way of ossifying what one may call the superior lobe of human feeling. 
for these pilgrims were kind-hearted people, and they would not have allowed that man to treat a horse like that. I wanted to stop the whole thing and set the slaves free, but that would not do. I must not interfere too much and get myself a name for riding over the country's laws and the citizens' rights roughshod. If I lived and prospered, I would be the death of slavery, and that I was resolved upon. But I would try to fix it, so that when I became its executioner it should be by command of the nation. Just here was the wayside shop of a smith, and now arrived a landed proprietor who had bought this girl a few miles back, deliverable here where her irons could be taken off. They were removed, then there was a squabble between the gentleman and the dealer as to which should pay the blacksmith. The moment the girl was delivered from her irons she flung herself, all tears and frantic sobbings, into the arms of the slave who had turned away his face when she was whipped. He strained her to his breath, and smothered her face and the child's with kisses, and washed them with the rain of his tears. I suspected. I inquired. Yes, I was right. It was husband and wife. They had to be torn apart by force. The girl had to be dragged away, and she struggled and fought and shrieked like one gone mad till a turn of the road hid her from sight. And even after that we could still make out the fading plaint of those receding shrieks. And the husband and father, with his wife and child gone, never to be seen by him again in life? Well, the look of him one might not bear at all, and so I turned away. But I knew I should never get his picture out of my mind again, and there it is to this day, to wring my heart-strings whenever I think of it. We put up at the inn in a village just at nightfall, and when I rose next morning and looked abroad, I was where, where a knight came riding in the golden glory of the new day, and recognized him for knight of mine, Sir Osana Lacure Hardy. He was in the gentleman's furnishing line, and his missionarying specialty was plug hats. He was clothed all in steel, in the beautifulest armor of the time, up to where his helmet ought to have been. But he hadn't any helmet. He wore a shiny stove-pipe hat, and was ridiculous a spectacle as one might want to see. It was another of my superstitious schemes for extinguishing knighthood by making it grotesque and absurd. Sir Osana's saddle was hung about with leather hat-boxes, and every time he overcame a wandering knight he swore him into my service and fitted him with a plug and made him wear it. I dressed and ran down to welcome Sir Osana and get his news. How is trade? I asked. Ye will note that I have but these four left. Yet were they sixteen when as I got me from Camelot. Why, you have certainly done nobly, Sir Osana. Where have you been foraging of late? I am but now come from the Valley of Holiness, please you, sir. I am pointed for that place myself. Is there anything stirring in the monkery, more than common? By the mass ye may not question it. Give him good feed, boy, and stint it not, and thou valuest thy crown. So get ye lightly to the stable, and do even as I bid. Sir, it is parlous news I bring, and uh, be these pilgrims? Then ye may not do better, good folk, than gather and hear the tale I have to tell. Sith it concerneth you, for as much as ye go to find that ye will not find, and seek that ye will seek in vain, my life being hostage for my word, and my word and message being these, namely, that a hap has happened, whereof the like has not been seen no more but once this two hundred years, which was the first and last time that that said misfortune shrake the holy valley in that form by commandment of the Most High, whereto by reasons just and causes thereunto contributing, wherein the matter the miraculous font hath ceased to flow. This shout burst from twenty pilgrim mouths at once. Ye say well, good people, I was verging to it, even when ye spake. Has somebody been washing again? Nay, it is suspected, but none believe it. It is thought to be some other sin, but none wit what. How are they feeling about the calamity? None may describe it in words. The fount is these nine days dry. The prayers that did begin then, and the lamentations in sackcloth and ashes, and the holy processions, none of these have ceased nor night nor day. And so the monks and the nuns and the foundlings be all exhausted, and do hang up prayers writ upon parchment, sith that no strength is left in man to lift up voice. And at last they sent for thee, Sir Boss, to try magic and enchantment, 
and if you could not come then was the messenger to fetch merlin and he is there these three days now and saith he will fetch that water though he burst the globe and wreck its kingdoms to accomplish it and right bravely doth he work his magic and call upon his hellions to hie them hither and help but not a whiff of moisture hath he started yet even so much as might qualify as mist upon a copper mirror and ye count not the barrel of sweat he sweateth betwixt sun and sun over the dire labors of his task and if ye breakfast was ready as soon as it was over i showed to sir osanna these words which i had written on the inside of his hat chemical department laboratory extension section g p x x p send two of first size two of number three and six of number four together with the proper complimentary details and two of my trained assistants and i said now get you to camelot as fast as you can fly brave knight and show the writing to clarence and tell him to have these required matters in the valley of holiness with all possible dispatch i will well sir boss and he was off End of chapter twenty one